I'm used to saying dates, so I'm going to say September the 3rd because it's September and I have to remind myself. Uh, but good evening. Um, we'll uh, begin <clears throat> our committee meeting. Uh, let me just start with Mr. Allen. Here. Hi, Mr. Allen. Good evening. Ms. Blah. Hi. Hey, how are you? I think I saw, I'll, I'll come back to Mira here, I believe I see her video away. Uh, Mr. Delgado. We don't have Mr. Delgado quite yet. Okay, Ms. Freeman. Here, hi. Hey, how are you? Good evening. Good, how are you? Thanks. Dr. Jackson? So oh, I see you on mute, Dr. Jackson, but I did see you raised. Good to see you. Absolutely. Do you mind um, muting here just so for the uh, recording folks can hear that you're present? It's your present, yes, thank you. All right. <laughs> Uh, is, uh, Johnson here, Tori? I'm here. How are you? Uh, I'm here. Uh, right, good evening, Mr. Johnson. Ms. Lewis. Vice Chair Lucas? Yes, here. Hi, right, good evening. Mr. Matthews? We have Mr. Matthews quite yet? Not quite yet. Okay, I'll come back. Mr. Oliver? I believe I saw Mr. Oliver. Uh, President, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good evening. All right. All right. Mr. Pulley. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. How are you? Good evening, Mr. Pulley. Good. Uh, I'm doing Mr. well, thank you. Good, good. Uh, Mr. Sorrell. Is Robert here with us? Not quite yet. We'll come back. Uh, Mr. Robinson. Mr. Robinson, not quite with us yet. And Mr. Woods? I think I saw Mr. Woods here. Are you on mute, Mr. Woods? There you go. Can you unmute for us one more time, Mr. Woods? I'm trying there. Does that take care of it? Yes, right. yes got it. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Blah? She's not quite back with us. And Mr. Matthews, I think that's the only two people we're missing along with Mr. Sherrell, excuse me, I think it's three. Ms. Bilal, good evening. Can you hear us, Mia? Yes, I'm here. How are you? Good evening. Good, good evening. Good, so we're just missing um, two people here, Mr. Matthews and Mr. Sherrell, Sherrell and we can keep our eyes and ears open here. I, I know we've got um, Mr. Button, uh, Ms. Sorello, you all wanna uh, introduce yourself. You're not on my short sheet, but you're certainly important to the, the work here. Um, yes, and I also was going to suggest that, uh, Brianna, do you want to reach out to uh, Mr. Cheryl and see if, if he's having any problems and if we can get him on? On it. Okay. And so should we, uh, uh, Mr. Button, we need to stop for anything or slow down or can we proceed here? No, no, I think, I think, you, should, I think you should go ahead and we'll hopefully get him online okay. uh, quickly. Perfect. And when Miss, um, excuse me, when Brianna comes back and Miss Crawford comes back, I'd love for her to just quickly introduce herself. I believe that she's the only person who didn't get an opportunity. Oh my goodness! Yeah, before, wonderful uh, intro as well. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, everyone should have the the agenda. Thanks so very much for all of you that is uh, have sent information into the group. Uh, continue the dialogue. Uh, clearly, this committee stays active regardless of whether it's Thursday evening or not, which is exactly the kind of tempo we need to continue. I want to just go quickly through our agenda because we have quite a bit to cover tonight. Um, of course, we'll right now we've just completed our roll call, call to order, but also now we're we're going through the agenda, but also a few updates. We just want to share. Mr. Button will share a few updates as well, followed by Ms. Cirillo, who will go through the level set packet, uh, a bit of an overview, but also an opportunity for us to ask questions to ensure everyone's on the same page as we go through this information that we've been provided with. Um, followed by that, we are um, we are welcome welcoming uh, Captain Blair, Lieutenant uh, Schmitz, as well as Lieutenant uh, is it Dupe? Uh, am I correct, uh, Mr. Button, in the pronunciation there? I'm going to defer to Deputy Loki on that. Okay. Dupuy. Dupuy. Thank you so much. Dupuy. Much more elegant than uh, my Nashville tongue did. Sorry about that. 
Um, so, uh, so, and we'll come back there for a testimony uh, as it relates to de-escalation and use of force. Um, and then we will uh, come out of that conversation um, and presentation and of course questions from the committee to then uh, focus in on the prioritization of the policy committee focus areas and then uh, close out our meeting with assignments. And we'll talk a bit about that. I'll actually use that as a segue into my comments as we were talking about ways that to ensure that everyone, one, is on the same page and has the same level of information, two, that you have an opportunity to do a deep dive on topics that you can then bring back to the committee for conversation, for discussion and awareness. Uh, but then three, also, because of the short time frame and all that we're trying to accomplish, there certainly just isn't enough time to get everything done if we try to squeeze it within the time frame of these evening meetings. So we, we will have to take on special assignments and there's 14 of us. So splitting that uh, across 14 people is certainly much easier to carry than one or two or three of us. And we can get in the, the weeds a bit more on that when we come back around. Um, I, I do want to uh, just acknowledge, I did share an email very close to the time of us meeting here. I, I just got an opportunity to step away from work and, and take, a time, take the time to type my thoughts out. But I went back through our recording of our last meeting I read through the email and thank you, Mr. Woods, for your diligence and sharing your thoughts and uh, opinions and recommendations. And then also I've just been doing my own research, like I'm sure many of you have. And I wanted to offer us a potential roadmap. This is not in stone, it's not even in ink. It is absolutely uh, ready to be pulled apart and reassembled as appropriate. But I felt that we should use some of our suggestions from last week, some of the ideas that came out to help us start to create a framework around our, our approach here. So we'll get more into that, but I just wanted to offer some acknowledgement of that. Um, and then there is just the last piece here, and I had a short note here. We'll talk more about, um, but I'd love to hear from the committee about how we feel uh, about just the pace of when we're sending emails. Um, is it helpful perhaps if um, we are sending emails maybe to one space and then maybe to the chair or vice chair and then we're sharing it out or are we all comfortable with just sharing it out to the larger body? Um, I just love to make sure that uh, everyone's comfortable with that approach too. Um, so with that, let me give the reins over to Mr. Button for additional updates and comments. I think you're on mute there, John. Thanks, everyone. Um, first, I've, I've appreciated the chance to work with Ashley and Amanda and my colleagues to prepare for this meeting. We have lots of interesting data flowing in, uh, which I think will be very helpful for future conversations. Second, um, I want to thank uh, Metro ITS, Kenya, for your help. Um, I think we may have, I, I at least have received quite a few invitations from Metro ITS this afternoon for sort of upcoming events and sometimes for the same event. Um, that's been a little bit confusing to me. I know that we are trying to schedule in advance, um, but we will uh, work to uh, to reduce the supply of, uh, of perhaps redundant invitations. I'm not quite sure what's going on there. Um, Thirdly, I just want to say thank you to uh, Captain Blair, Deputy Chief Loki, to your colleagues for participating in this and, and making time on very short notice to spend an evening with us talking about use of force. Um, I'm looking forward to this discussion. I think at some point uh, I will need to probably to find a time. Um, uh, Ashley and Amanda, we're going to stick with first names. Um, to talk with you and make sure we don't have too much overlap among committees. Uh, the Workforce Committee in particular definitely sees as central to its role some of the things that you put onto your agenda. I think there are ways for um, different committees to work productively, and I can follow up with you guys about how to do that. But with that, I'm happy to turn this over to you. Thank you, uh, John. I'm, I'm fine with first names of everybody else's as well. That's, that works for me. I'll be Ashley. That's just fine. Um, so let me, let me uh, uh, if Ms. Crawford, if I'm using Ms. Crawford, but when you introduce yourself, we'll start using Brianna. Would you just take a moment to unmute and, and uh, introduce yourself? We, we missed the opportunity to get to know you uh, last week. 
So welcome. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Breonna Crawford. Uh, just putting the name to the emails you get from me. Um, I'm currently a second year Vanderbilt master's student um, and getting my degree in education policy. And I'm here to help serve you all, whether that's uh, ensuring you can make it to meetings, taking notes, and connecting you to the resources you need to be successful in this. Um, and so I am grateful for this role and excited to be here. Nice to meet you, Ms. Crawford. Uh, Brianna, are, are you from Nashville? Most folks said where you're from. Are you in Nashville? Oh, sorry. No, I'm actually from New Jersey. Uh, oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, so kind of a Southern implant. That's all right. We adopt you. Nashville adopts everybody quickly. So welcome. Uh, Thanks. Perfect. So we will move along here and uh, welcome Ms. Cirillo to uh, discuss the level set packet. Okay. Well, good evening, Ashley and Amanda and members of the committee, and please call me Dia. I really would appreciate that. Um, so what you received earlier this week was the level set packet that represents, really represented most of the significant data that we received from MNPD, and it was condensed down to very specific 35 pages um, so that you could really see sort of the information structured according to the methodology that we're moving along with, which is really understand how much is being done, how well it's being done, and who is better off um, by the actions of MNPD. Um, that said, um, I think we can all agree that there's more information that we're looking for. Um, we've been um, in some very, really constructive conversations today with MNPD. Um, some of the missing information in there was actually number of arrests for the last five years and arrests by demographic group. So those are coming in as we speak. Um, you know, um, we've also been in good touch with MNCO and Dr. Baylor. Um, and um, we, we, we might have missed, missed the boat on getting uh, one of Dr. Baylor's um, graphs into um, some of the talking points in the deck that I'm going to share. It's a very short deck. But in the meantime, I just want to be sure that everyone had a chance to sort of walk through the level set packet. The first section is on forced demographics. Um, again, under forced demographics, we did not receive number recruited. We do not, you know, have an idea of how many um, have been, you know, fired in place. Um, so we don't have those numbers yet. If as we get that information, we, we certainly would pass that on. The next thing in the packet are crime incident counts. We then go into heat maps that are really trend lines from 2015 to 2019. And then we go into specific heat maps for 2019. And then we get into use of force data which includes type and trend and resisting arrest. And then finally, we close out the packet on officers um, and um, their experience in injury and their application of use of force and complaints of use of force um, and, and years as officers um, uh, compared to use of force. Um, so what I'd like to do today is, if I may, and, and I'm hoping that Kenya can help me with this, um, is to share a deck, um, just a few slides to talk through um, just um, sort of our opportunity, our assignment before us. Um, we have, we will be joined very shortly um, by staff from Academy. Um, and um, so that they can talk about how they train for use of force. Um, so I'm gonna stop for a second and just be sure, um, I'm just gonna ask my colleague, John, I'm gonna use the um, deck that is um, open in the folder unless you have a, a more recent version. So give me a second here. And I've made you the presenter as well. So whenever you're ready, you can share your content. Thank you so much, Kenya. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, okay. So you should see a PowerPoint. 
before you. Um, and as you know, there are three questions that we're really using to help guide our discussions around specific program performance. It's how much does MNPD do? How well do they do it? And who is better off um, based on these actions? Um, and I wanted to concentrate very specifically on the question of how well do we do it tonight? Um, because um, use of force exists. Uh, we know that every police department uses it. Um, and so the question is in using it, how do we know what is good performance? And how do we reinforce good behavior um, among officers? And how do we discourage and eliminate I mean, really, I think we're all very interested in eliminating bad behavior. Um, so these are questions of performance. Um, and I really invite the committee to join me as we take, as we zoom in on some data points that are in the level set packet um, to help um, really frame the discussion tonight and hopefully as we move forward. Um, so the next slide that you see before you is page 35 of the level set packet. Um, this is directly um, from that packet. Um, it's use of force by employee race and gender. And it's based on the 2019 use of force um, forms that are called the 108s that are submitted. Okay, so these are all 108 forms that are submitted. In column one, we have the gender and race of the sworn officer. In column two, we have um, the number of 108s. So it's a one-to-one -one number. It's, it's for every incident, each officer has to submit a form, okay? Uh, column three shows us the percentage that those forms are of 100%. So in 2019, there were 533 forms submitted. That's 100%. And in column four, what we see is the percent of demographic represented in the MNPD sworn officers, okay? So if we look at row one, um, black women sworn officers, they represented 1.6% of the force in 2019. So I share this with you um, because this is certainly one metric of how well we are doing in use of force. This is a bivariate metric, it shows the number of forms by each demographic and gender group in the sworn officer population compared to their representation in the total sworn officer um, group. Uh, however, um, we really don't know if that's good or not for a couple of reasons, and I'm gonna advance the slide. or I thought I was going to advance the slide. Here we go. So in the second slide, what we can see now is a comparison of the total number of forms compared to the total number of sworn officers. So now we have more of an apples to apples comparison Okay, so we can see among black women sworn officers, 19% submitted a 108 form in 2019. Among white women sworn officers, 27%. Among other women, 13%. Among black men, 41%. Among white men, 37% among other male sworn officers, 33% submitted a 108 form, which means this is the percentage of that specific group that has submitted a use of force form, okay? So the average is 36%. Do we know, is that good or bad? Do we know, what does that tell us about performance? And what I've learned today is that most of this 
is bad math. Um, and it's bad math because the reality is that use of force reporting and analysis methods vary broadly across every police department in the country. There is no known national standard or method for analysis. So we do not know if an average of 35% across the whole force really means anything about performance. The other problem with the slides that I showed you is that um, we have the number of forms. Um, so we know how many forms have been submitted. So there were 533 forms submitted in 2019. Um, we did not until very recently before we started this evening have the number of duplicates. So clearly one officer could submit more than one form. And we received this analysis from Dr. Baylor um, this evening, shortly before we started. And my apologies, um, because of some logistics on my end, I didn't have a chance to get it into this deck, but I will get it out to the committee so you have that data, those data as well. But I think what is really important, the other piece of information that you have received in your inboxes, even if you haven't had a chance to look at it, is a very interesting report um, that MNPD put together at the end of last year um, comparing standards um, and performance at MNPD to other cities across the nation. Now, the fact that there are no known national standards or methods for analysis to evaluate performance in terms of use of force raises a really big question for Nashville, particularly post George Floyd. It really says to us, what is an important standard to establish for our Metro Nashville? And that I think, and I really invite the committee in on this, would be a very good use of time um, to have the committee's expertise and depth of experience brought to bear on that question. What is the right standard for Metro Nashville when it comes to use of force so that we know how MNPD is performing? So with that, I'm going to step aside. I'm happy to ask any answer any questions uh, that committee members may have. So I, I'll turn the mic back to you, Ashley. Thank you, dear. Uh, any members of the committee have any uh, questions or uh, thoughts, please. Are we all comfortable with the uh, level set back to us? Please feel free, Mr. Oliver, go right ahead. Yes, yeah, so, uh, it's LaShawn. I think that was a good um, question at the end, and I like um, idea broke down. Um, out of the 500 some odd um, report, you don't get a full picture. So I think the real thing that I'm interested in is tell us what's the story because I can tell you I read reports all the time and those reports when I come across my desk tell a story but when I report out statistically it doesn't tell the public the same story that we're looking at and so a lot of time a lot of important information is left out proportionately from the first slide it looked like the use of force was proportionate to the ratio of the officers. Now, when we looked at the second slide and you saw um, it being compared apples to apples, it was much different, but it doesn't say what does that 36% mean? And so I think when we're looking at this metric, if no one has, it's not nationalized and no one else has this, this is an opportunity one for our city to set those standards and start being standard bearers but I think that's where, you know, uh, a COB comes in place where all these at least come across those desks can be having eyes put on them and looking at the policy in comparison and saying, was this a good use of force or, and this is the other question, is there another alternative for a better outcome? And these are the things that we want to look at, in my opinion, when, when I'm looking at these analysis to make it better. Um, it doesn't mean 500 and some are bad, but 
if there's opportunities, it could be done better and we could have avoided a worse. That's something I would be more interested in when I'm looking at the metrics for measuring a good use of force. Thank you, Sean. This was a great point. So, Dia, anything you want to respond there to before? Yeah, we don't have information right now on what's in the reports, but I am taking notes and I'm happy to get more information about that. And are we, could I just ask that to LaShawn's point here? So understand um, what you were sharing about, look, the current standard, a, a standard national standard does not exist to review this. I was also uh, kind of looking around, I saw something, and I'm happy to share this. I just didn't want to share it unnecessarily if it wasn't going to be helpful. But there was a, um, a report I found from the National Criminal Justice reference service that uh, also referenced, you know, the measuring and explaining of police use of force being a bit of a tell of two cities is how they described it, um, that it could, uh, you know, be described in various ways and tell different stories. Um, now, I know we're reaching out to folks like Dr. Valier, who'll come before the, the committee for conversation, but since we are looking at this data, perhaps we need to have him in his expertise earlier, you know, sooner rather than later, I guess, um, is what I mean, um, since we are kind of at the midway point next week, if we, we stay within the six week uh, time frame, I'd love to know if other members of the committee feel the same or feel differently on that. Too. And just really quickly, Ashley, on that point, Dr. Baylor is prepared to present next week if the committee so desires. Okay, great. Any other members of the, that, well, we, we here take silence as uh, consensus here, so if you feel differently, feel free to unmute. Uh, otherwise, I think we certainly should move forward with having to speak. Um, Amanda, I see you yeah. unmute. Yeah, um, I think Dr. Valier's on this call, is he not? I see him down at the bottom. I see him. Oh, I see him as well. Um, well, I mean, we have, I, I, I thank you, Amanda, I think that's helpful. Um, I want to be thoughtful in, of Ms. Dr. Valier's time here. He probably didn't expect to come before the committee for a testimony tonight. That's not a, a pre-Labor Day Thursday night request anybody like, so I understand that. But I do want to welcome Dr. Valier if you want to just, uh, you know, maybe offer just an overview of the materials that uh, Deal will be sending to us later today. That'd be great to, to, to hear as well. But we're still going to get to ask questions later about the Absolutely. Interior. Mm-hmm, absolutely, absolutely. Dr. Blair, anything from you? You know what he, yeah, I see him there, go right ahead. Um, am I on as a presenter? We can hear you, yes. Okay, great, so what I sent to Dia this afternoon was basically since um, officers may be involved in multiple incidents during the year um, to, be able to, to make that comparison to the population of sworn officers. Um, I, all I did was pull together um, the number of officers who had submitted one or more forms during the year. Um, and and Dia is right that depending on who you on who you ask, what report you look at, what study you look at, use of force is going to be conceptualized differently. So the outcome is probably going to be different. Um, what's included as a use of force it differs really substantially between departments. Um, some departments consider anything more than unresisted handcuffing as a reportable use of force. So for instance, Dallas includes any force as something that gets tracked statistically. Um, next week, I'll be talking about consent decree recommendations and some of those and the recommendations from the Department of Justice is that different levels of force have different tracking, but all force should be tracked somehow. Um, so I'll get more into detail that next week with a little bit more um, structure, um, but uh, Dia is absolutely correct that there's no sort of standard. Um, departments differ widely in how they count force and um, it makes it really challenging to try to compare. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Mayor. Mr. Woods, any questions from you? 
Thank you. I want to go back to the statistics on page 35 that Ms. Cirillo was presenting. Did I understand you correctly, Ms. Cirillo, that the racial and gender background column is the race of gender of the police officer involved? Ms. Cirillo? Is she with us? I am indeed. My mic is open. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Um, and as we look at um, page 35, if you have that in front of you, um, what we have in that graph is the race and gender of the officer that submitted the form, okay? My that question is, is What's the race and gender of the citizen or person that the force was used against? That's what I'm interested in hearing because you or your office sent us about half an hour before the meeting started, the national study, the nationwide statistics on this, showing that nationwide use of force was used against blacks 3.6 times more often than against whites. So and Mr. the national stats may be the same. That's what I'm curious to find out. Right, so Mr. Woods, in the packet, the level set packet that went out on September 1, and I'm just pulling this up. Um, I actually have it spread out um, in the old fashioned way in hard copy across my desk. But if you go to page 29, page 29 of the PDF packet, if you have it open as a hard copy, it's, it's number 29. If you have it open as electronic, it's gonna be 30 page 30, there is use of force rates for resisting arrest um, by um, race. So that is the information we received from MNPD. I agree, Mr. Woods, that we don't have it broken down specifically to those 108 forms. And that is something we can ask for. I'd, I'd like to ask for that especially since the national statistics are so alarming and obviously discriminatory. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Any additional questions or comments here? Ashley, it's Warwick Robinson. I, I have a question. Uh, we, um, there was conversation about the Form 108, I believe, and I don't know that I haven't seen a copy of that. I see Captain Blair on here with us, and I was wondering if he could tell us a little bit about the um, how long that particular form has been used and and how often it's uh, reviewed or revised and just give us a little background. I, I'm very interested to know also, okay, so an officer uses force, he or she completes the form, where does it go and who's reviewing it? Those are my questions, Ms. Davis. Thank you. Captain Blair, uh, are you available to, to answer that? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for having us and taking an interest in the training academy. With me here tonight, I have Lieutenant Dupuis, who's over confrontation management, what deals with firearms and defensive tactics, and they do the force continuum. They do all that training. And then Lieutenant Schmitz, who's over all the trainees and our in-service training. So that's the de-escalation part. And our de-escalation starts from day one. We start teaching it, and everything we do is de-escalation. I mean, our ultimate goal is to get compliance. That's the bottom line. If we can get compliance and talk, we're happy. We're thrilled. We really are. People follow the law. We have compliance and there's nothing we have to do. Everything's good. Um, if people would follow our directions, things would be good. It's just sometimes that doesn't happen. So 108 is filled out. That form has been updated throughout the years. <clears throat> it used to be a front and back form. When Chief Turner was the chief, you'd fill it out and you'd slide it under his door at the end of the night, the sergeant would, and nobody would review it. That's what it started out as in 1998 till probably 2003. When Chief Surpass was hired and came on, we revamped the entire system. Now you fill out a 108, a sergeant will respond to the scene, conduct an investigation, 
And these packets are thick. <clears throat> I used to review them on midnights. We're talking 15, 20, some of them are 30 pages long. They're pretty thick. And they're pretty detailed with the information on there. And right now, a use of force has to be filled out, and it's been like this for quite a while. Uh, anything above soft, soft empty hand control, a 108 has to be done, and an investigation has to be done. Also, several years ago, we were just talking here on the side, we we're trying to figure out what year we started doing it. It's been so long. If there's injuries, for example, if the handcuffs are on too tight, we're doing a 108 investigation. So that's probably why some of your numbers are so high. You need to get those injured ones out because an officer didn't apply force, but a 108 was completed. If they bang their head against the plexiglass and they get a cut, if you're walking them to the, the jail door and they trip and fall and you don't catch them, that's a 108 packet. Any kind of injury whatsoever has turned into a one-way packet. So really the packets have to be looked at, or there may be someone keeping track of that on the side, which I'm sure they are. Which ones are the injuries and put those to the side, then you could rerun your numbers and see where you're at. But the review process, after the sergeant looks at it, he does it, his lieutenant will look at that and they'll review it and they'll go back and forth for questions or whatever. After it get done, is done with that, in most precincts, it goes to the PACL which is accountability lieutenant, they look it over. After that, it goes to the commander. Then it goes up to the bureau office where the executive, executive officer looks at every single packet, not just use of force, pursuits, complaints, all that stuff from every single precinct, they look at those. Then the deputy, deputy chief looks at that one. From the deputy chief, it goes to the field captains who work on the midnight shift, and then they review all those packets. And when you review them, you think, okay, everything's everything looks good, or if you have questions or it's like, this isn't right, something's not right, you send it back. Maybe it's remedial training, maybe it's suspension days. So there is some packets that end up in, in disciplinary action. There also have been packets that have been done that people have lost their jobs over. Uh, just recently, uh, an officer fired four rounds at a vehicle and he was terminated. Well, he, he resigned in lieu of, of being fired, but he was gonna be terminated. And that was a one away packet. So. And then at the final conclusion, they go to the chief and the chief signs off on them. So there's a lot of levels of review and review on the packets. And if we see something going on across the country or we're CALEA uh, certified, if CALEA tells us, hey, this is best practice. Everybody's going to it. We're making one of our standards. You need to do this. We automatically adapt to it. If CALEA says we need to do it, we do it. Um, right now at the training academy, we're, we are accredited. We're at the gold standard. We have 159 standards that we have to follow. I have a full-time uh, CALEA manager. If she tells me something's not right, then we get it right because we follow the CALEA standards. Uh, the department is also accredited, and then they have a bunch of other standards, and then they work back and forth to make sure we stay with what CALEA says to do. And then we also follow PERF. If PERF tells us that this is the best option, we try to adapt it, but we try to make it the, the Nashville way to fit our community and we follow that pretty regularly. I hope that answered your question. Mr. Robinson, any follow-up here? Um, Captain Blair, it, it, it seems like it, uh, the 108, that touches a lot of desks and, and a lot of reviews. Um, is it, one of my questions was, so if an officer at West Precinct fills out a use of force form, does a supervisor at West Precinct review that or is it sent to another precinct to, so that it's um, maybe a supervisor from a, does a supervisor from a different precinct ever review the 108 forms? It can be if it occurs on an extra job or something like that, and another supervisor will take it over because it goes back to your chain of command. Everything kind of stays in the chain of command until it goes to the executive officer. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the executive officer, they kick a lot back. I don't know what the percentage is that he kicks back, but a lot get kicked back. I had to fill in for that job for two weeks and it's the worst job ever because you read all day long. And I kick a lot back. You know, you, the things you just, whatever for whatever reason it may be you kick them back to get it figured out and worked out or the field supervisors will kick them back or a deputy chief will kick them back so they're really uh critiqued pretty hard uh, i i would recommend you guys get a hold of one and, and read it and look at it and you can kind of see the review process of it and what goes into it 
Um, so, you know, even for a simple thing, the handcuffs are too tight. It's a pretty long review. Captain Blair, do you think that perhaps we could look at one that went up the chain and you can maybe just redact the names and any personal information, uh, perhaps one that was an issue, there was an issue, um, and maybe perhaps one that uh, it was approved up the chain. I'm, I'm just very interested to see uh, how the reviews are signed off on, who's looking at them, and um, trying to get a feel. You know, this is this is an enormous uh, undertaking for this board, and the more knowledge we have, especially as it applies to our Metro Police Department, I think that's going to understand, help us understand what we do here when we're listening to other experts or other people that that are maybe telling us there's a, a, a suggested standard or different standard somewhere else. So thank you, Captain Blair. Yeah, and just so you know, uh, you can check around the country. I mean, we're not shy about it, but we have a probably a higher and more critiqued reviewing process than most places in the country. And you can ask them that have been disciplined or terminated based upon use of force. I mean, there's a good source of information for you too. Captain Blair, thank you. Actually, to that point there, your last point there, I'd just uh, love to hear, hear, you mentioned two points that I wanted to, to make sure I was very clear on. We think about those that when we check who has been, you know, uh, terminated based on um, a use of force complaint or an investigation that came back with a finding there. Um, what what is the the current position though on, on positions where we allow people to uh, resign before they are terminated for such a thing? Is are we tracking that as well? A, you know, that's more of an HR thing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I know it does. We do do that, and you mm -hmm. know, a lot of times too. Um, because of due process, trying to get people terminated and out the door, you know, it's easier to say I quit is a lot faster than trying to get someone terminated. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you can always get, you always beat somebody out the door, you know what I'm saying? Because that's that process. I don't have all that information, but I would refer you to either Metro HR or Police HR for that kind of information. Okay, thank you. And then and then just secondly here, and we kind of uh, gone into the kind of uh, rubric four of our, our agenda here, but when you mentioned when you um, when you all are made aware of best practices in other uh, areas and you adopt them, uh, and, and what's included in use of force versus what's not, and I was taking a bit of notes here on my my end. When we think of something like psychologically, what could be considered use of force is um, uh, do we consider you know uh, a police officer presenting their gun or pointing it in the direction of a, a person? is a uh, use of force or is that not does that, that not ring the bell currently based on policy it does it's a level of use of force it depends on how you're pointing it if you're pointing it at what's called a low ready mm -hmm. no that's not necessarily a use of force because you're not pointing at anyone you know you got to remember whatever the circumstances is an officer has to be ready for that because someone's action is always quicker than reaction right. um but another thing too we also do every time an officer pulls and this is something that's changed here recently across the country, and we have adopted it. Um, every time an officer pulls their service weapon in the performance of their duty, other than if it's training or like we're qualifying or you're cleaning it or something like that, you have to fill out uh, a, a form detailing the entire scenario, why'd you do that, and then that's reviewed for justification. And that is something that's just taken place, I don't know, Lee, is that? Is it within the last year is a recommendation from PERF. Okay, so with Lee saying, Lieutenant Police saying, within the last year, it's been a recommendation from PERF that we have we are following. Thank you. Thank you. It's helpful. Thank you. Committee uh, members here, any additional questions here before? Thank you, Captain Blair. Any uh, additional questions here before we move to the testimony and the this presentation here? I have a very brief one, if you, if you please, Madam Chair. Of course, of course, please. Uh, yes, Captain Blair, just one brief uh, uh, question for you. Um, 
in my day, uh, what we would consider to be use of force certainly doesn't happen uh, all the time. And it, it, it usually draws an awful lot of attention on a particular platoon or a particular shift. Uh, we've talked a lot about a form 108 and all of the levels of scrutiny that form goes through. Uh, however, uh, I would certainly think, uh, and you can uh, confirm this for me, but uh, uh, a shift supervisor would certainly be made aware of this before ever uh, filling out a particular form and begin some level of investigation uh, shortly thereafter uh, uh, from the Use of Force Act. Uh, is that not correct? And can yes. you see that level of investigation before um, any paperwork's ever filled out? Yeah, so when a Use of Force is reported to a supervisor, they are by policy to respond to the scene immediately, whether it be a hospital, or be out on the street or wherever. And their job is like any other investigation. You interview all of uh, the suspect that's in custody, any of the witnesses, um, any of the family members that may be there, any anybody that has seen anything possibly, because you got need to determine, are they seeing it? Are they an actual witness? Or are they just secondhand? You know, they showed up the scene after the fact. The last person that you will talk to in that investigation would be the officer. And you would put that all together and you, you would write up your report, your supervisor review of it, tell you and the officer would fill out the 108 and then the supervisor would complete their review of that and uh, their investigation with findings. And that supervisor report is independent from the uh, 108 that we're discussing, is that correct? It's part of one whole packet that goes together. Okay, thank you. The officer never never gets his hands on the review. Yeah, it's it's with policy. That's the way the policy is established. But the super, the supervisor is the supervisor is doing his investigation to make sure that the actual use of force was within policy and training and best practices. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Captain Blair, I understand we see why I hired him. He's good. Get he's a good man. <laughs> of course, well, Captain Blair, I think we we had you uh, come in and start reading from the middle of the book here. Would you like to begin at the the top here in the beginning here? Of course, um, we welcome you too. All right. Well, thank you very much for having us. And like I said, uh, my two lieutenants here they're very involved in our training and, and getting that moving. And, you know, we start de-escalation training right from the very beginning. Uh, we start out with ethics. We start out with character building and what we expect people to do. And we talked about respecting people and, and interacting with people and how, how you go about doing that. Uh, we have a generation that we're hiring from all over the country. Only 26% are from the middle, middle Tennessee area of this class. Everybody else is from someplace else. You know, we pull our officers from society. So as society goes, you know, police recruiting goes. And uh, they're all over the place. But by the time they graduate, they're made, they're, they're a perfect public servant to, to do a good job. Every now and then, is there a bad one? Yes. Um, no good cop likes a bad cop because it makes our job extremely, extremely difficult. Uh, after Minneapolis, you know, I'm extremely cautious who we put our patch on. Extremely cautious. If they don't need, if they're not, if they're not gonna be the standard that we want, they're not gonna wear that patch. Uh, just, we're just not taking that risk. So we, you know, we, we're always evolving. We're always changing. You know, we spend over a thousand hours of training. This class right here, normally we do 26 weeks. This class we have right now is going to do 32 because we want to spend some more time in different areas and we want to improve our training. Uh, we started out with a no stress situation for a week, getting them used to everything, doing a lot with our behavioral science unit, trying to get them to deal with stress and resiliency and all this other good stuff that we do. And that's one of the things that we track that I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, we do track, you know, attendance and how many use of force do you have and how much time, all these other areas that you do. And it sends up a red flag to where that has to be reviewed. Is this officer using too much force? So there's a system already in place to catch uh, people like that, potential problems from occurring. Uh, and I could probably get you more information about that. I just don't have it with me right now. But really, compliance is the biggest thing. Uh, you know, we always try to get compliance at the, at the lowest level possible. If we can get it with our mere presence and giving verbal direction, that's awesome. It really is. Um, I don't know if any of you ever used force before, but it's no fun. I don't care what TV says and all that other stuff. It is no fun. 
It just makes the day more complicated, makes the job more complicated, and it really hurts community uh, interaction. So, you know, when we our, our kind of philosophy is what I'm bringing to the academy is, is when an officer arrives on the scene, they're really the first detective there. Uh, they're the first detective on the scene, gathering information, trying to help out, trying to figure out what's going on, and really trying to come up from an angle of being a problem solver. And I think that's what the community wants. You know, they call the police because they have a problem. They want it solved. So we have a lot of room in that area to do. Our solve rate is not as high as it needs to be. But you got to have that trust to get that done. So that's an area that, you know, every department across the country is always working on. So are we. But without further ado, if you have specific questions about, you know, de-escalation or the use of force continuum and how it's trained, uh, you know, Lieutenant Dupuis and Lieutenant Schmitz could answer those questions for you. If they're very extremely detailed, then I would really like to get the instructor who teaches a course to speak with you, you know, later down the line so you get a better understanding and just kind of listen to you guys on the front end here. I mean, you got a big task and I thank you very much for taking it on. But honestly, to be fair to you, you're going to need someone from the department on every one of your subcommittees to answer your questions so that you so you can make some, because otherwise you may make a decision and get something that you don't like. But that's just my suggestion. What do I know? Thank you, Captain Blair. I appreciate it. If you could hold here, I just want to extend the floor to the committee members here. Um, or Lieutenant, would you uh, continue? Feel free as well, too. Okay. I guess just give them a breakdown of. So um, I'll start off with uh, just how we teach use of force and defensive tactics. Uh, it is based on our, our use of force policy. So everything that, that we want to teach uh, is in line with our policies. Uh, we teach uh, the very first level of force is an officer presence and verbal direction. And we teach uh, a verbal defense and influence, which Lieutenant Schmitz can, can go into a little bit more detail on that. But our, our lead defensive tactics instructor is also a verbal defense and influence instructor. So uh, if we have to deal with uh, any sort of situation, a confrontation type situation, the first thing that we want to do out of respect for all human life is to try to use verbal direction, verbal commands, and we get what, 24 hours or 16 hours of, of just verbal defense and influence. Then we start out with our uh, actual use of force. We do an overview, uh, a little bit of classroom where we go through the use of force continuum, uh, which, like I said, starts out with uh, just officer presence. Just maybe an officer showing up onto the scene could uh, get a bring a situation uh, some stability and uh, put a, a suspect into compliance just by the mere presence of a uniformed officer. If that doesn't work, then like we said, some verbal defense and influence. Uh, our next level is um, actually uh, a soft empty hand control. And so we spend we spend probably, uh, about 16 hours of just an officer approaching a subject, giving verbal commands, uh, getting them to uh, direct a, a compliant subject into handcuffs. We teach them their handcuffing technique, how to approach a situation. Um, after that, we do a soft empty hand control, which is um, just a, a control technique. It's something that would likely result in no injury. Uh, our next level of force would be uh, intermediate weapons such as pepper spray and taser. Uh, we spend uh, about eight hours each on those. Uh, and then our next level of force would be hard empty hand control, which would be uh, hand and foot strikes, uh, maybe heavy takedowns that could possibly result in an injury, uh, depending on uh, the surface of the ground. If it was uh, a takedown to asphalt, that would be uh, hard empty hand control. 
then we also teach uh, impact weapons, uh, which we use a, a baton. Um, and then we finish up with uh, several weeks of firearms training. During those, during the, uh, all of our actual instruction on the techniques, we do a, a very heavy focus on giving verbal commands and directions uh, to hopefully gain compliance. We teach, uh, we teach the, the use of force, the actual use of force techniques um, so that the officers will use the least amount of force necessary uh, according to the use of force continuum. So in other words, the officers have to know all of the levels of force and if a subject is not complying to verbal commands, officers, according to the use of force continuum, are allowed to use, by our policy, the next level up, if that makes sense. So if uh, we have a passively resisted person who uh, is not complying to verbal commands, an officer is allowed to use soft, empty hand control by our policy, um, and also by su the Supreme Court decisions, uh, he's able to use that next level of force. Um, there are uh, certain things that the officers have to take into consideration. They have to take the whole totality of the circumstances into, the con into consideration when deciding what level of force. So if it is a very large suspect, um, say, uh, if anybody knows Tex Cobb, real big, muscled up guy, um, and you have a very small officer who uh, maybe weighs 120, 130 pounds, um, soft empty hand control, a, a takedown or a joint lock or anything like that is probably not going to be effective on a very larger suspect. Um, also, if there's drugs involved or anything like that. So the officer may need to make a decision to use hard empty hand control, may have to make a decision to use hand and foot strikes or even baton strikes um, because that might be the only thing that the officer can do to, to gain compliance. Um, but they have to articulate that. They have to be able to uh, make those decisions in a very quick manner. Uh, speaking of a, a quick manner, one of the things that we really focus on is maintaining a, a good distance from a suspect because we know that uh, time, uh, distance, and cover will allow officers to make uh, a little bit better decision on, on what type of force to use. Um, so we always try to have our officers maintain a good distance uh, from a, a suspect so that if a suspect takes any sort of action, they have time to decide what level of force to use based on their observations and based on the, the behavior that's being displayed by the suspect. But the whole thing is is to gain compliance using the least amount of force necessary. Uh, and we go through, we teach them the techniques, we practice the techniques, uh, we give them a written test, we give them a practical test to make sure that they're able to uh, apply the right technique at the right time within the whole totality of the circumstances, if that makes sense. Um, finally, um, after they get all their training through all the levels of the use of force continuum, they, they go to the, the gun range, get 80 hours of gun range training. They get uh, shoot, don't shoot targets, uh, meaning uh, the targets will indicate that this is a unarmed person um, and they may come into a situation where we have turning targets and targets may turn and this is a don't shoot target. So we're expecting the trainees not to shoot that target. And then we'll have a target that turns. 
that has a, a weapon or something like that, and we're expecting the, the trainees to shoot that target. We're trying to challenge their decision-making processes. We're teaching them to uh, observe the whole body, mainly the hands, because that's where weapons can be held. So we're teaching them to use time, distance, uh, cover, such as a, a vehicle or behind a brick wall, so that they can make decisions, so that they can see uh, if a suspect has any weapons and, and see the behavior that the suspect is demonstrating. Um, and then finally, towards the end of their, their uh, training session, uh, the last few weeks of their before they graduate, uh, we do reality-based training um, in all aspects. And Lieutenant Schmitz will talk about the patrol techniques, but we actually do reality-based training where we have instructors and role players uh, presenting our, our trainees with uh, either a compliant situation where uh, they, and they don't know, they don't know what the situation is, but we uh, present them with a compliant situation and a non-compliant situation. And what we're looking for is if they make the, the correct decision on what level of force to use, as well as apply uh, the technique properly, if that makes sense. How many hours of DT do they have? Uh, as far as um, physical defense tactics, uh, they get approximately 100 hours of the actual instruction on the techniques, uh, as well as reinforcement. Um, they get approximately 80 hours of firearm standards. And these, uh, these standards nearly double what is required by uh, Tennessee Post Commission. Um, I believe uh, there's 38 hours that are required of physical defense tactics by post. And we, we uh, by far double that amount of training. It is our philosophy that the more training that we can give our officers in physical defense tactics, uh, the more likely they are going to make better decisions out on the street. And we test that through the reality-based training, uh, a written test, and a, a practical demonstration of the technique. And as Captain Blair mentioned uh, a little bit ago, uh, this next class that's in right now will get even more than that 100 hours of physical defense tactics. And we're, we'll be able to reinforce that and hopefully uh, ensure that, that they have the skills that they need uh, to make good decisions out on the street. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Hey, Thank Madam Chair, Bob Allen. Please. I, I do have a question. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry, not, not, oh, hey, uh, Lieutenant. Just a comment and a question. So would you believe that if officers were more well-trained in empty hand control, that they'd be less tool dependent, meaning they would less often use tasers, batons, pepper sprays, and things of that nature? And would we have less complaints against officers because they are skilled at empty hand control? Well, I'm not sure if we'd have less complaints, but I think um, the the tools such as the the taser and the the pepper spray are in between on the use of force continuum. They're in between soft empty hand control and hard empty hand control. So they're in between uh, soft takedowns, joint locks, and hand and foot strikes and and hard takedowns. Um, well, we see a lot of, uh, in this generation, uh, with the, the technology generation, a lot of our, our uh, trainees and officers, and we see this across the country, uh, are, are very tool dependent to where um, they do want to go to their pepper spray or their taser first when it may be a situation where uh, somebody with a little bit more experience or training 
uh, might be able to accomplish this situation with a lower level of force, such as uh, soft empty hand control. We also see yeah. uh, we also see officers that probably should use hard empty hand control, such as hand and foot strikes, to to uh, gain compliance. We also see officers relying on the tools such as pepper spray and tasers, which are a lower use, use of force or a lower level of force. Um, we see them using those tools when they shouldn't in that situation. And that could have an effect where if the taser doesn't work, um, then they may have to jump to an even higher level of force uh, than they originally should have used such as uh, uh, lethal force, firearms, or uh, a baton. Whereas they may have been, if they were confident in their skills, uh, if they had um, more training uh, in, in their, their hand and foot strikes, they may, have been, had, they may have been able to resolve the situation with that. And that's, that's where we're trying to get to is is uh, they only have just a lot of times just a, a few split seconds to make a decision on what level of force they use. Uh, and we do see uh, a lot of times, not just in our department, but across the country where officers are tool dependent, wanting to use the taser, wanting to use the pepper spray, uh, when uh, a different level of force would probably be more appropriate. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh to Madam Chair and the committee, you know, from teaching uh, thousands of civilians and cops alike, it is always, uh, I've always noticed and stood right next to people when confrontations are about to happen. And it certainly seems that the person who is more prepared, feels good about their skills, less often uses force than a person who is afraid or not confident in their ability to handle the situation. And soon I'd like a recommendation, make a recommendation about training and the time they spend on MTN control. And if tonight's not it, I can hold my thought, but um, I sure would like to sooner or later. Thank you. Ms. Allen, I think it's great. You, would you like to exp uh, expand a little bit more on that? Yes, yeah, sir. Um, so again, when you watch videos from cops across the nation, and again, I still teach uh, police officers from different cities and the thing we see them, uh, a lot of them lacking in is empty hand control or being skilled at the tools they would use. So again, if we get more training on empty hand control, whether it's grappling, defending yourself, <coughs> wrestling, anything like that, A, a conf an officer feels more confident and is less likely to overreact than a person who feels scared to death. That's the person that pulls a baton out and hits somebody in the head when the person didn't need that. They just need to be put on the ground and handcuffed. So, you know, from out there teaching us training academy for 23 years, we ran about 60 hours of defensive tactics. And that encompassed everything, every kind of use of force, um, excluding deadly force. And I honestly believe that could be increased three to four days uh, additional to the training so that these um, trainees who become young police officers and hit the streets would feel as skilled as the at least the people are facing if not more skilled and i kind of equate it to martial arts training so if you went to martial arts training two days a week and did that for three or four or five years obviously you're going to be better than a person who comes to in service and practices that once a year does that make sense yes thank you mr allen and before and let me uh, just pause here we lieutenant's extended space for time for questions miss um Ms. Falaw or Mira. Yes, um, thank you so much. I just wanna say for your service, I know as you go through this use of force continuum, you also have minutes to seconds to make the decision as you kind of go from one through six, ultimately, and I know it's very difficult. This week, I tried to spend some time researching on the lethality of less lethal weapons, and I found it somewhat hard to come by um, I know that there was a study um, done for Physicians for Human Rights, and in that, they found that um, after one week after the death of Mr. Floyd, 
they documented a hundred serious injuries to protesters and they were all to the head and neck. So this was kind of in a crowd control situation. And as I look at this use of force, it almost seems like going from like a taser to a hard empty hand to a firearm. Is there anything in between? You know, it seems like taser to firearm and if head and neck is the focus. And I guess that's the question. You know, the question is once you get to the firearm level or rubber bullets is um, how do you use them? Where do you use them? Where do you point? But looking at all of the head and neck injuries that are out there right now, as soon as you get to this point, it seems like going very fast from taser to gun and I would love to know if there's anything else in between those things to use that would be effective. Okay, so um, one of the things about less lethal is there is a potential that it could be lethal, and that's why they call it less lethal. Um, so with the, the taser, um, it's not 100% foolproof. Sometimes a taser could uh, cause death or serious injury. Uh, for the most part, um, it basically just helps immobilize a suspect. And we teach our officers uh, to, and, and actually everybody who teaches uh, TASER has to uh, teach under the same curriculum. And there's certain target areas where we want our officers to uh, aim for and uh, and actually hit the, the the suspect with the taser so that it is able to be used uh, in the most effective manner. Uh, and that's the, the big, large muscles of the back and your uh, glutes area. And you, we also want our officers to uh, use that taser from an appropriate distance to where they can get a good spread of the probes um, so that the uh, current can go through the most muscle mass and uh, incapacitate or immobilize a suspect. Uh, our tasers will generate uh, current for about five seconds, and we train our officers that that is a window of opportunity for our officers to move in and get a, a person in, into custody, apply the handcuffs, within that five seconds of actually deploying a taser. Uh, where the taser could get deadly is if, uh, if it accidentally uh, hits somebody in the head with a probe or another area. And, and so we don't, we train our officers to uh, use good target selection uh, to, to um, and, and that's the same with, with the less lethal the uh, rubber bullets that you're talking about, those would be considered an impact weapon, and that would be a level of force in between uh, hand and foot strikes, hard empty hand control, and uh, firearms. So the less lethal for rubber bullets would be the same as a, uh, a baton strike, only you are, are given the ability to do it from a distance. So it's a, a, a safety issue for an officer. Uh, if there was a crowded situation, um, an officer wouldn't want to go into that crowd uh, with a baton and run the risk of the baton being taken away from him. Or uh, accidentally, if there was a bunch of people that were together, um, he wouldn't want to hit somebody else who may not have uh, been exhibiting behavior that caused the officer to need to use um, an impact weapon. But the reason why they call the, the rubber bullets less lethal is uh, they're, they're coming out of a, a firearm um, and if they hit somebody in the head, just like a baton, if you hit somebody in the baton, that could be uh, considered deadly force, and that could uh, cause death or serious bodily injury. So they call it less lethal, but it is, uh, 
it's basically the same level of force as a, a baton, if that makes sense. And, and I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. Uh, any additional questions here? I see uh, Mr. Delgado. Yes, I had a question. Um, uh, the uh, captain mentioned that uh, since Minnesota, they're a lot more cautious of who they want to put that badge on. So obviously, we're all aware that um, things have changed in the country. And while I recognize that we're a, a gold star uh, a police department, my question is, so you've talked about, uh, Lieutenant, you talked about, well, or, and Captain, going from like 26 to 28 weeks to increasing to 32 weeks of training. You talked about how you're going to increase the physical technique trainings and uh, different takedowns and, and so forth. And all of those things I, I agree are important. And I do think that a better trained officer is less likely to use those forces when they know the impact they can have. But I'm curious if you've implemented any training knowing that now you're going to be engaging with uh, a public that is a lot more afraid of police officers. They're a lot more sensitive to race. They, they realize what's changed. They are probably maybe even most likely to want to run from a situation where they normally wouldn't out of fear for their <laughs> life. So um, if, if there is any training that you guys are increasing, does, is any of that in how you're engaging uh, with uh, people of color or in certain uh, demographics and how you engage them to try to um, re reduce that uh, potential. You talked about taking down a, the 16 hours of taking down a compliant subject, which are, are trying to, obviously they're, they're not being compliant if you're having to use verbal techniques and different things and you're trying to uh, calm the situation. So with the change in our nation, what uh, techniques, if any, or training are you guys increasing? Say the one thing, Real quick, you know, this isn't, since, since Minneapolis, there has been some changes, but really change has been going on since Ferguson. And this department has made a lot of changes since Ferguson and across the country we have too. So a lot of our, our every time we have a class, hey, how can we do it better next time? It's always evolving. And we're never going to get to the point, I, I want the commission to understand this, we're never going to get to a point where we're done learning and we, okay, we reached it, we're all done. We can, you know, that's, that's never going to happen. We're constantly going to be changing. We're constantly going to be getting better at it. And really, you know, we have a generation that has a hard time talking. They can text you left and right, but talking is a big deal. You know, you and I can talk all day long, but we probably can't text each other. So <clears throat> that's something that we challenge and, you know, Lieutenant Schmitz and his crew do a good job with that and they get on with day one, okay? Uh, you know, they were kind of on our case, their group's on their case today because they're calling us the grammar police because we are correcting their grammar in a report. They, I guess no one's ever corrected their grammar before. Well, we're gonna correct your grammar. You know, we don't want you getting up there on the stand with something that's not correct and testifying it makes us look bad. So I'm gonna let the Tim Schmitz uh, complete answering your question. Good evening. Thank you for for your time, and I, and I truly appreciate it. I do want to just throw out some numbers, just so that if you if you all wanted to jot them down, you can, and then I can answer that question a little more closely. I think it was touched on earlier. The Tennessee Post Commission for a new officer requires 480 hours, on average. Since I've been here at the training academy since 2018, we have averaged just under 1,000 hours. So we're doing twice as much training as what the state requires. Some of the topics that the state requires us to, to teach are topics such as interpersonal communications, um, human relations, law enforcement stress, uh, professional and ethical conduct, and those all have specific hourly requirements that per state regulations we have to do. And in every single category, we obviously meet that, and on almost all of them, we obviously double that. So keep that in mind. I think another thing to consider when we're extending the, the period of time for the uh, recruit session is it's ensuring that every single trainee gets the equal amount of training. Um, when we have a larger class like what we have now, I don't want to cut it short and leave it in a structured box as what we've done before, uh, because then we tend to rush through training and there's no need to do that. So when we've got a larger class, 
we can expand that class. And what, what ends up happening is we expand the training to ensure that every single trainee recruit obtains the same amount of training. Um, the best way to learn is through adult learning, which is actually doing. So it is a progressive process of us telling them what they're gonna do and why they need to do it. Then we're gonna show them, but most importantly, it's letting them do it and apply that. And not to just do it once, but to do it in repetition so that it almost becomes automatic. I know Captain talked about verbal defense and influence, and I know Lieutenant Dupuy did too. That is something that we conduct 16 hours of training on, and we also do what we refer to as reality-based training, which is like scenario training, kind of similar to what Lieutenant Dupuy was talking about, which is it's about as real of a scenario as possible in a controlled environment with role players that tend to be those specialists in that area. So we will do a four-hour reality-based training <clears throat> with our domestic violence division on how to properly respond to domestic violence incidents. What better way to have the, the evaluators and the assessors as those that actually do that every day that they come to work. So we do that verbal defense and influence and it really starts with basic, as crazy as it sounds, professional greetings. If you were to get stopped by a Metro police officer on a traffic stop, I would guarantee you that the interaction would be practically identi uh, identical for every single officer. They're gonna introduce themselves, they're gonna tell you what agency they work for, they're gonna tell you why they stopped you and then they're gonna ask for probably your driver's license and paperwork. And what we're trying to do and what we've been successful in doing is expanding that, what, what it's called as a universal greeting to all aspects of interactions, not just on a traffic stop. It could be a consensual encounter. It could be a domestic violence incident. It could be various different types of incidences. So the verbal defense and influence also touch on important factors such as um, emotional intelligence, and it really boils down to one key factor, which is, and it sounds cliche, but it is true, which is treating people right. And the big key with that is, is taking somebody else's perspective. It may be different than ours. We may not necessarily agree with it, but the key is to try to understand that perspective for better understanding and better communication so that the end result is a better outcome. In that block of instruction, we also talk about ethical intervention, which is really ensuring that not only do we uh, uh, really focus on the community that we're working with, but also each other and being able to identify when even we act inappropriately and being able to handle those uh, situations professionally and appropriately to make sure that we address it right then and there, the proper people are notified so that it can be addressed so it doesn't happen in the future. Other important blocks of instruction uh, that I at least want to touch on is we also do a, a various large uh, number of different blocks of instruction to better interact with the community. So we have a block of instruction on how to interact with autistic, um, the, the autistic community. We also talk about um, how to interact with Alzheimer's patients. We have a two hour block on how to interact and communicate with people with various degrees of hearing loss. We have 10 to 12 hours of command Spanish. Uh, the trainees will go off campus down to the National Library and learn about the, the civil rights movement of Nashville back in the 60s. There's still a lot of people that were born and raised here that were alive back then. And as Captain talked about it, we do have a large number percentage on this police department that um, are not from this state. So trying to understand that's really important. Um, so it really is looking at the totality of the circumstances of how to better serve the community that we interact with. And that's done through really understanding different perspectives to provide that to the, the citizens that we're, we're interacting with. So I just want to make sure I, 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 and I've, I've read through the 26 pages of your training and so forth. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's impressive. I'm not, I'm it's not like a loaded question. I'm not, I just like, my, my, you guys are just constantly from what the captain said, you're constantly evolving in your training then depending on what's happening in the country, but there isn't necessarily anything like you said, since Ferguson, there's not necessarily like a new class or anything that you guys are implementing. And I'm asking because our task is to try to come up with some ideas that we might be able to help uh, uh, the new chief of police and to help uh, our officers uh, continue to be a gold star, Kalia, in this new world that we're living in. Okay, so, it, go ahead. I, I, let me answer that question. Mm -hmm. So, Manuel, back in about 2014, I want to say, uh, I know that Captain talked about PERF, which is the Police Executive Research Forum. They came out with this decision-making model 
which was really to help police officers slow down critical incidents. By slowing down incidents, they can gather more information, assess different risks, and then know what policies and procedures that they have in their toolbox, and then act on it. It's actually a circular um, model versus a linear. So at any point, if you get or gather new information, you have to start that whole process all over. And and I know that Lieutenant Dupuy talked about this, and, and part of that does employ, if we can create greater distances and seek cover behind solid objects, then that buys us extra time to think about what new information did we gather, what threats, if new, have we been able to identify so that we can appropriately um, handle the situation at the least level. So that was in the mid-2010s. 2000, uh, and then three years ago, uh, we deployed verbal defense and influence to the entire department during in-service. It was a 16-hour interactive uh, in-service course, and that involved them actually being recorded. And if you've ever been recorded, most people don't like themselves being recorded. So it really gave them a raw uh, example of you can say what you mean, but does your body language also match that? Because that is part of how you communicate with people. 55% of a communicative message is by body language. So you can say one thing, but if your body language and your tone mean something else, it doesn't really matter what you say. So that was done with the entire sworn personnel. The, the recruits got that a year prior. So we always are looking at, as, as Captain said, we always are looking at new, new processes, new courses out there, even if, if it's very similar to what we already teach, there still might be one or two new things that we can take out of that. Um, probably about six years ago, we started uh, teaching fair and impartial policing, which talks about implicit bias. And uh, we're getting recertified. I think we're getting about three to four of us recertified this month. And uh, the executive staff is attending a course in November that's going to be very similar. It's, it's based off of racial, social, and emotional uh, intelligence and how that works together. And when I reviewed uh, the course, it's very similar to verbal defense and influence. But just because it's similar doesn't mean that it's not better. It doesn't mean that we can't get something out of that that we can incorporate into verbal defense and influence ourselves. So we're always looking at things. We, we don't ever say, hey, we found a program that works, and that's all we stick with. We're going to look at other courses that are available and offered that potentially could be better, address certain aspects that maybe we haven't touched on enough, or can bring it in a different manner because not everybody learns the same that can trigger a better retention from somebody else. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Delgado. I, while we have you here, just a few questions. You mentioned the civil rights uh, training and down at the library and the history of the, the 60s and the role of Nashville. But are yes. we also, yeah. is that space and time also, are they, are they learning about just the history of race relations within Nashville to bring it more present day. Just uh, and it sounds like I just want to know if it's more historical or is it also present day brought back to right. So right. let me answer that in two ways. The, the answer is it's more historical for that block of instruction. <clears throat> but when we talk about the fair and impartial policing block of instruction, Ashley, we use implicit bias and and usually racial implicit bias is the most obvious one. So that's discussed uh, a lot during that block of instruction. Mm -hmm. And then towards the end, probably about a month or so before graduation, we do something called the Mobile Diversity Tour Seminar. And that is also off campus where we visit three or four different communities within Nashville, Davidson County that really target different uh, aspects of our community. So um, we will go visit a, a, a mosque and interact with the Muslim community. And then we will stop at Casa Asafran and interact with the uh, Hispanic and Latino uh, community. Uh, then we stop by um, uh, Club Play off of church, and we interact with the LGBT community. And then we tend to finish that uh, all-day seminar at Fisk University, where we interact with African American, obviously, it's a historical university. So we do uh, that mobile diversity tour, and it really is very interactive and it gets us into their environment. And I think that that helps us understand a lot better. So we do, uh, we do address that both historically and in current times. 
Gotcha. Thank you. And that leads me to just the last question here about social interaction. And so what would be the, do you by chance know what is the, you know, required kind of minimum hours of training or engagement as it relates to social interaction versus that of what MMPD requires? So there's not a specific block or title that says social interaction, but I can at least tell you over the last class that graduated, which just graduated August 6th, inter interpersonal communication, which we utilize for VDI, the verbal defense and influence, the fair and impartial policing, command Spanish, and, and a couple other topics, that state requirement is 25 hours, and they completed 39 hours. Human relations, which, uh, as I mentioned before, autism, um, uh, Alzheimer's, civil rights, hate crimes. There are a couple others that I, I totally forgot, and I apologize. We also go to the Jewish Community Center in West Nashville, and we learn about how law enforcement agencies back in the 40s uh, was utilized against the people, how the Nazis used local law enforcement to their benefit and how traumatic that could be. Um, that's part of human relations. That requirement is 30 hours, and we conducted 56 hours of training in that uh, category. So as you can see, again, it's at least, we obviously meet minimum requirements, it's almost double, and then professional and ethical conduct, although it says it's only three hours, we conduct seven, which is close to 10. So at least it's more than double that. Okay, thank you. And is it possible what you're, you're sharing or listing there, and I've been trying to take due diligence and notes here. Yep. Is that possible yep. to be shared with us? Can we share that, see that as a committee? Yeah, so we've got a document called the, the whatever the session number is, the curriculum. It's about a 40-page document, which breaks down every single block of instruction, how long it was, and a, and a brief description of what entails that block of instruction. So we Great. can get that to you. Thank you. Section 11, section 11 that you're talking about in the training? Section 11. They may not have it. Right. I, I don't, uh, yeah, since I don't have your materials, I don't know exactly what you're referring to in terms of Section 11. Okay. I had a quick question also. Mm -hmm. um, so two pieces. The first question is, is there any type of training that you haven't had that you wished you did? And then secondly, um, in my work in San Antonio, we had crisis intervention teams and also mobile crisis outreach teams for different departments. And they were multidisciplinary teams that were made up of law enforcement officers um, with counselors, nurses, medical professionals, different combinations of things to help um, go on the scene and were very effective and often de-escalating the situation with all of that group bringing a different skill set to work together. Do you have anything like that, or would you be interested in any type of, uh, of that type of multidisciplinary team? If so not? we're always, we are always up for partnerships into ensuring that, that situations are handled the most appropriately. Uh, to ensure everybody's safety, and that's not, that's officers, that's citizens, it's really everybody. I did not mention that we've got a block of instruction uh, uh, titled Law Enforcement Response to Mental Illness, and that actually is taught by um, members of Mobile Health Co-op, and they actually have a liaison that solely works with the police department that does respond to those. If you're not familiar with mobile crisis, if we get somebody that's got um, a mental episode, a mental health episode, we can contact them and they may have some history on that subject and they can assist and they can help out either by us bringing that person to them for an assessment or they can come out and conduct an assessment on scene of where we're at. But there have been several times that that liaison has responded to such as a barricaded subject uh, to help us uh, mitigate that uh, to gain compliance and, and obviously end in a, in a very healthy situation where somebody, uh, you know, uh, comes out for us for that assessment. So we've got that in place, but that doesn't mean that we would not obviously be opposed to a, additional aspects of that. We want to get out of the business. Ashley, I'm just going to jump in very quickly. This is Amy Cirillo, and I just wanted to acknowledge Lieutenant Schmidt and um, Ms. Bilal's um, comment that we are working on putting together a presentation of that, of that program. We want to be sure committee members have an opportunity to really learn about the breadth and depth of that uh, partnership. 
Um, so we will be teeing that up very soon, okay? Thank you, Ms. Skirt. Any additional questions or comments here um, for this portion, for the testimony portion of the agenda, for members of the committee here? I see that Larry has had his hand up for a while. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I, that's great. I got to ask questions earlier, so I don't mind waiting. Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of questions real quickly. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, first, I'm say, Captain Blair, I watched your um, interview for an hour or two with Vice Mayor Jim Schuman a couple of weekends ago. You did an excellent job. You did a great job representing our police force in that interview. Uh, it's up on YouTube. So if any of the members of the committee want even more detail uh, about Captain Blair's work and the training, uh, the Women's Political Collaborative YouTube channel has that interview. Uh, I think I'm pretty sure it's already posted. Uh, it was very informative. If I could ask, and I'm not sure that Captain Blair and his two cohorts are the right people to ask, uh, do you have a copy with you of the final report of the Metro Police Department on use of force analysis dated December 20, 2019 that was sent out to us about two hours ago? Was that no, I don't. I, I think that's something that. SDD put together. I don't have a copy of that. I haven't oh. read that yet. All right. Uh, let me ask a couple of other questions. First, uh, on the implicit bias testing that one of you was just talking about, do you use for the new recruits the Harvard implicit bias test or a similar test? It, it's put on by the Fair and Impartial uh, Policing LLC, and I'm trying to remember uh, the, the female... Um, uh, CEO of the company, but they're based out of Florida. Okay. Uh, do do the officers or recruits? I'm not sure what you want to call them at this point. What do you call them? Officers or recruits? They're recruits. Recruits. Yes. Do the recruits after they take that kind of implicit bias testing? Do they write a self-assessment of how they think they did on it? So what we do? So Larry, during that that block of instruction, what we do is we actually conduct it off campus here. And normally they wear uniforms and that day they're in civilian clothes. Uh, that is a topic that what we want is we want brutal honesty between everybody involved, including the instructors. So even our staff instructors are dressed in civilian clothes that day. And we go through not only what implicit and the difference between implicit and explicit bias. We talk about stereotypes. We, we learn about how those are formed. And then there are a lot of studies that are presented uh, that show how implicit bias works. And then towards the end, there are a lot of scenarios that we will read out that um, are within a group discussion about seeing different perspectives. And it ends with, uh, if you've never uh, um, read up on the incident involving the NYPD uh, and a gentleman by the name of Amadou Diallo, uh, right. roughly 20, 25 right. years ago. And it ends with that story. And um, just really seeing how the, the recruits interact with each other and, and the staff, uh, I think is extremely beneficial. So that's, so I would say a, that's a their assessment. Story and therefore good teaching yeah. lesson. Right, right, right. But I think that I would I would articulate that that's their assessment that day is, is the group discussions. Well, as, as one member of the committee, obviously the committee hadn't had a chance to really convened to talk about all this information and testimony and data. Uh, I want to say that I've been involved with observing uh, the Metro National Police Park training program in the 1970s, in the 1980s, in the 1990s, and more recently. Uh, I've been involved as a criminal justice professor. I've been involved as an attorney representing police officers where training issues were raised. I've been involved as an attorney suing police officers where training issues were raised. Your training program is light years ahead of where it was 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I can't really speak to the last five or six years, but it certainly sounds to me like you and your team are continuing that kind of progress, and I applaud you for it. Let me ask a specific question, since I'm really interested in trends. You know, how are you doing as compared to 10 years and 20 years and 30 years ago? That I can measure. When we're talking about use of force, one of you said each one's a different story, and I couldn't agree with that more. And that's why for the committee work, it's it's difficult to really analyze. We had, you know, what, 500 and something use of force reports last year. Should it have been 700? Should it have been 200? Uh, it's almost impossible to know because, as you said, each use of force report is a different story in different circumstances. 
So I'm not sure you're the right officers for me to ask these questions of. Feel free to tell me, no, that's not really your expertise. Uh, reading over the material very quickly, so I could have some of these numbers wrong, but I think I got it right. I read it very quickly, scanned it before this committee meeting started. Last year, we had 533 use of force reports. The year before, we had 358. The year before, we had 366. In other words, last year, we had a roughly 50% jump in the quantity, the number of use of force reports. Do you have any feel or opinion as to why there was that huge jump last year? And if you're not the right people to ask, just say so. I mean, we're gonna have other, we're gonna meet, yeah, meet with different people. Probably not the right person to ask, but I think it goes back to my earlier statement where injuries, uh, if handcuffs were put on too tight, if uh, the bank head against the car or a supervisor makes the decision, if we had promoted a lot of new supervisors last year, you know, young supervisors, they get nervous real easy and they'd be like, all right, we're just gonna do a 108. It may not be a 108 situation, but we're just gonna go ahead and do it. Uh, we have some supervisors that, you know, they're cautious, too cautious the one way. And then you always have supervisors who are too cautious the other way. The goal is to maintain balance. How do you right. get to the middle? And I'm sure it goes back and forth. Yeah, and, and that is interesting. I would like to know, but I think first you have to take out all the injury ones, why there was a 108 documented, move those to the side, then let's see what that number is. Does anyone in the police department make that kind of analysis where they move those to the side? Is that data we could? We That's could... a question you have to ask somebody else. I don't know. I wish right. I had an answer for you on that one. I, I really want to drill down on table three on page five, but but you're clearly not the author of that, not the not the expert tonight, and so I'll I'll hold off on those questions. One more training question that I think you do know or, or would know. One of my specific uh, recommendations to the committee so far is that when Metro police officers get promoted, I come as a recruit, I pass the training, I get certified, I pass the post standards, I do a good job, I get promoted. And a few years down the road, I'm a sergeant or a lieutenant, and I'm now taking on in management and administrative duties as well. Do I routinely get more training from you from the department in management and administration? Is that something we should be saying, hey, we need more of this kind of training as well? Well, this is what we do, and I'll, I'll let you make the fair assessment of it. When uh, a sergeant gets promoted, officer to sergeant is probably the hardest transition that you're going to face because you have to get out of that officer mentality and you have to get into that management mentality. So that's a hard transition. After that, you're just adding more pieces to, to the mix. So for example, if you can run a district as a sergeant, you can run a detail as a lieutenant and all the way up. It's, you're just adding more people under your command. So we send them to a new supervisor school, which is five weeks, oh, excuse me, not five weeks, five days. Now in some parts of the country, they do five and six weeks yeah. supervisor school. They pull them away to do that. We, if we did that, we wouldn't have any supervisors in the in the field. It'd be it'd be rough. It'd be rough to do. Uh, we try to do that before they get promoted. Sometimes it's a little bit after they get promoted. Corona's put a, a kink in that this time because we're filling it up on distant learning. Uh, lieutenants used to go to the same training twice again. So you'd go as a sergeant, then you make lieutenant. You go to the same training. It really wasn't beneficial to them. Uh, we spend money. We send people up to Perf for the senior management course up there in the summer. And we usually get two to three slots uh, for each session. There's three sessions in the summer. So we send them up there. We do SECLA and then we do uh, Northwestern has a 10 week school that right. I went to. Right. And it's like going to college. It was hard. I didn't think I was going to pass the thing. I, I it, was tough. Think it is hard. <laughs> it is hard. So um, we send people to that course too. I would love to have more money to send more people to it. Uh, we've been talking amongst us since I got here in November. I want to change in service to where officers go together, sergeants go together, lieutenants go together because commanders and captains go together. And then we focus on certain things each year for them to train on. But trying to get 50 sergeants together to do in service training when they got to be in the field working, that's pretty hard. Okay. And then to, to break that down, it's almost a logistical nightmare for us right now to do something like that. Sure, I can appreciate with the illness, the COVID-19 especially. One final question then, again, I'm trying to look at trends. You say it's a budget question as well, which is obvious that you're right there. 
Has your budget for training remained the same in recent years? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? What's the trend for your financing for training? Since I've been here, I've never been told no. Uh, oh, my predecessor, you. my predecessor's done the same thing. If we needed something to get, we got it. Um, I think at the precinct level is trying to get those supervisors to training. There's really not necessarily money for that. That's probably where the increase needs to occur. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Woods. Thank you, Captain Blair, as well. Uh, committee members, any uh, additional questions or comments here uh, for our guests? Yes, I, I have a couple of questions. If I may. Um, and I'm not sure which of the captain or the lieutenants. Um, my name's Amanda, and um, I did the um, shoot, don't shoot simulator and the um, real life um, training when I was a fully sworn law enforcement officer about 25 years ago. And my question is this, the thing that I remember most distinctly from the shoot, don't shoot scenario is that the presence of a handgun did not necessarily justify lethal force, that the um, suspect had to have the oppor ability, opportunity, and you had to be in jeopardy, that the mere um, possession of a handgun uh, by a suspect what is the training around that uh, that the officers receive at the academy? And I know, as we've said, different people have said several times, you know, it's a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but does the presence or possession of a handgun in a suspect um, justify lethal force by the way that it's trained to the officers? I'll let Lieutenant Dupuy answer that question for you. Yeah, absolutely not. And. Um... So in, in part of our, our overall use of force classroom portion, and this gets reinforced several times um, in just, you know, talking points throughout our, our uh, demonstrations of techniques and everything, uh, we want our officers to be able to uh, recognize that a person with a gun doesn't necessarily mean that that is a deadly force situation or a person with a knife. Uh, they have to have uh, several things, but the main things that they have to have is uh, the intent to use that gun. They have to have the means to, to use deadly force, which would be a weapon. Uh, they also have to have the, the opportunity. And, and so they have to take all those things into consideration um, and I can give you an example. If, uh, if there's a, a healthy 22-year-old male that's, that's got a gun and he is saying, I'm going to use this gun and shoot you, he's got the, uh, the means to do it because he's got a gun. He's got the intent to do it because he's telling you that he's going to shoot you. He's also got the capability uh, because he's healthy and and um, you can you can see that he's got the the capability to do that. But if uh, our our seventy five year old grandmother has a a knife in her hand and um, she says, "I'm going to stab you with this knife," she may have the intent to stab uh, me with that knife. She may have the ability or she may have the opportunity or the means because she actually has a knife in her hand, but she may not necessarily have the ability based on the distance from her to me. Um, and I can control that. I can get myself behind cover. So we take that, that means or that capability out of the equation and that turns that into a don't shoot situation. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Uh, just one other question very quickly. You had talked about um, the implicit bias and perspective taking uh, and the um, hours. Is the implicit bias, is that conducted by the same company who does the VDI, the Vistalar? So it's not. It is a separate company. The Vistalar Verbal Defense and Influence uh, Company uh, many years ago uh, did something called Verbal Judo. 
Right. If you right. remember hearing about verbal judo, it's it, it's yeah. a lot more in detail now than it was back then. Um, <laughs> And, and a lot of additional material has been presented, but they're two totally separate uh, organizations and companies. Who teaches the implicit bias and the perspective taking courses so, that you teach? So we, we oftentimes we go to what they call train the trainer classes. So it's a lot more in depth. It's a lot more intensive. It usually lasts twice as long as to, to somebody that's just attending the course. They're given the materials and then they can come back to the agency and then turn around and teach our, uh, our either sworn personnel or our recruits. So currently we've got uh, four people that teach the fair and impartial policing, and we have upwards of about six or seven that can teach the verbal defense and influence. Okay, so the, they are officers who go to the train the trainer um, events. Who teaches the train the trainer events? The organization does. Meaning MNPD? No, no. So we bring in the, the company to conduct the mm -hmm. fair and impartial train the trainer course. So it is their material, their course, they teach right. it to us, and then we bring it back and teach it to our person. Gotcha. And who are they? Uh, I would have to get you the, the I want to say her name's Lori Fernell, but I can get you the names of fair and impartial policing. Um, the uh, verbal defense and influence is a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Gary Klugowitz mm -hmm. and that's Dave Vistalar. And, yes, and that's Vistalar yes. and Dave Young. Those are the two from Vistalar. But I can get you the names for uh, the fair and impartial policing. And that would include the perspective taking. Yes, they Wonderful. both actually they both actually do have perspective taking. Okay. Um, the the FIP is more of a implicit understanding maybe my perspective, whereas the, um, the, the VDI perspective, I think, is, is, deals with a lot of the proportionality. I was right. Well, Fredell, yes. I was close. Lori Fredell is for uh, FIP. Thank you for looking that up, Lieutenant Dewey. And that's the um, name of the company or the instructor? That's, that's the actual owner of FIP. Oh, okay. He is the owner and, and uh, CEO of, of FIP. And then um, perspective taking in the uh, VDI is very similar. It's, it's getting them to understand uh, legitimacy, not only with what they're experiencing, but also us. And that's where uh, so much, and you've probably picked up on this tonight, it's not one block of instruction and then a separate block of instruction. Right, you can right. see how they're kind of intertwined. And that's sure. why what Lieutenant Dupuy said earlier about why it was so important to have one of his staff members go through the VDI, because it is all one progression. It's not just verbal de-escalation and then use of force, and they're two totally different separate things. It's all part of one conglomerate of a progression that we're working through. Right. Um, and do you all, just one last question, and thank you all so much for your time. We are so grateful to you all for um, spending this time with us. Do you ever have individuals with lived experience speak to the officers at the academy? Anybody? Yes. So, yes. Sorry, so the, the um, uh, Mike Helm, who teaches the block of instruction for interaction with um, people with various degrees of hearing loss, Mm -hmm. um, he, he cannot hear. So we bring in somebody that can, uh, do ASL and helps through that block of instruction. We've got members from the Alzheimer's association that actually teaches that block of instruction. So we utilize a lot of what we would refer to as outside instructors that really are the experts in their field to teach, uh, to teach us, um, because as good as we are, what better way than to come from them? Um, so that's that's who usually will teach those those type of courses. When you're talking about mobile diversity tour seminar where we go to different places, yes, those are um, that's taught by people that live in that community that are stakeholders and, and community activists that can help facilitate that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time so much. Thank you, Lieutenant Smith. Uh, any additional questions or comments here from members of the committee? Ms. Davis, if I could ask one follow-up question for, for Captain Blair. Um, you or your lieutenants talked about with the new recruiting classes that, that 
they were going um, or increased uh, maybe from 24 to 32 weeks. Um, what about as far as I think when we look out and see the police involved shootings across the country that have concerned a lot of people, it seems to be veteran officers, not necessarily new on the street officers. Have there been any changes made or as far as um, the continuing service uh, education where where um, officers come in yearly to, to get some kind of um, training are, are we in are, are we able to increase those days or is it still maybe one week I think is what I heard and can you help us out there yeah so we call it in-service training and the state of Tennessee requires 40 hours of continuous training and is it 12 or 18 hours is automatically dictated to us what we have to do. There's a certain number of hours. It's almost, it must be in the twenties. That's already dictated that we have to do. We have no choice. We have to do uh, that. Yeah, yeah. So what we get, we get maybe 12 hours or 15 hours. We can do what we want. We do a lot of active killer training to keep those, those skills fresh because of everything going on in society. Um, we have experienced that here in Nashville you need to be ready for that. And then that approach has changed. So we continue with that. Um, whatever trends are going on. So right now, we just set up mental health is another one. We just set up this year, next year's in-service training. So it'll be going. It takes all year to get the training done. So if something kicks off between now and then, the training's already established. So then we have to go to roll call training and put that stuff out. Hey, this look for this trend. This is what we expect you to respond to. And that's done by the details and the different sections. And they, that, that's on a continuous basis. But usually we do over that. We do a lot of on, um, distant learning training, and sometimes we've done close to 50 hours of training a year. For example, the state of Maryland, they're only required to do 18 hours a year for training. That's it, 18 hours. And the reason I know that, I saw that on the news the other day, and I was kind of shocked by that about a couple weeks ago. Uh, yeah, an ongoing, we always have ongoing roll call training is what they're telling me. And then if someone's not doing something right, or they mess something up, or there's we get some disciplinary action on something, then we do remedial training. And I was kind of surprised at how many forms because of remedial training, because I have to sign off on every single one of them. And I'm like, goodness gracious. But they come back out, they get tracked. A lot of it's for driving. You know, we seem to back up into everything. Um, so we do a lot of driving training, or maybe it's handcuff training, or maybe it's, hey, you weren't talking to this person right, so let's go back through VDI. You know, it depends. It's individual based to help that person out to be a better employee. Thank you. Uh, Captain Blair, just the last one here on the uh, remedial training. Is they, is that brought up, let's say, I know you pointed out driving, but if it's something along the lines of handcuffs or um, that, that could be related, is that coming to fruition because of the 108 form? Or um, or if someone says, look, we, I think you, one lieutenant called it the universal greeting, someone is uh, witnessing that and then reporting it, like how does that, how is the bell rung on remedial training? All of the above could be a supervisor, could be a citizen complaint, could be a 108. Uh, it could be another officer reporting it. Hey, my partner here is not doing the right thing, mm -hmm. and then we get involved. And most of it's small. It's small stuff, you know, that you do remedial training. Because if it's a major thing, then it's suspension or termination and so forth. And then that's wow. all in the policy there. You know, 4.10 and 4.20 explains the entire disciplinary process of the department. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Captain Blair. Thank you also uh, to lieutenants as well. Just, uh, I don't see any other members of the committee unmuted here. Um, so if, and, and if I'm saying forever, to hold your peace here, but I'm sure we can reach out to you, Captain Blair, if we have follow-up. Thank you very much uh, for your just uh, expert testimony. And as Ms. Lucas said, to all three of you for your service too. Thank you very much this evening. We appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you yes, very sir. much. If you need something, just let us know. We sure will. Thank you. And um, let's uh, proceed here um, with the prioritization of the policy committee focus areas. And, and I wanted to just acknowledge here at the bottom of your uh, agenda, you'll see in bold uh, that I took our, our last uh, comments and just uh, tried to use that as a space to get us started because I believe that there was a bit of a consensus, at least it sounded as such, around de escalation use of force as being our primary. Uh, focus. 
uh, in, in, in target areas and themes, however you want to uh, title that. But there was also uh, a very clear stream uh, line conversation around culture, and that was around relationship with COB, accountability. We've heard a lot about that um, already this evening. Um, and then the third piece is a kind of a broad engagement with citizens. And I did share something out here, but I'd like to just pause and, and ask if there's additional ideas or how others might flesh that out that was a bit different or if you understand it to be different or recommend that we do something different. Yeah, that's it. Can I take the unmute as a um, all positive uh, and not an eight o'clock I'm hungry because uh, I know we haven't uh, eaten dinner here. My camera's on just so y'all know I'm not cheating and eating dinner on you. Um, but I, I think that it sounds like we're, we're in agreement here. So, it, and if there's any additional thoughts here, I, I think we can, we'll take the time, but let's, let me just say, say here, if we're in agreement with these three kind of pillars of focus for us, um, then that will help us with the next portion of the agenda, which is to determine how each of us will be, you know, deployed in these areas. And so we've heard a lot of information. We have a lot, everyone has a lot to read over Labor Day uh, weekend here. Uh, and I ask that us just take some deliberate time to do that. Um, but uh, Ms. Lucas, do you wanna just guide us through maybe, um, maybe kind of five pieces where we can all just sign up and uh, find our, our task for the week? Yes, hi. So um, I went through um, both Bob Allen's um, email to us and to Larry Wood's email to us and did a little brainstorming on my own. And so I just came up with five uh, different areas that we may be able to focus on and do some work on. One of the things that we had talked about, Ashley and I, while um, we were sort of conceptualizing how this work may go, is the idea that it would be really helpful at the end of every meeting to sort of have assignments, uh, to have a list, and we can include those in the minutes that go out to everybody that says, this is what we're gonna do in between sessions. I think you all received my email the other day where um, I kind of uh, used Larry as an inspiration to say this was it's great, what he offered and what Bob offered was something that we could um, do and take a look at in between um, meet or excuse me, share our suggestions with one another uh, in between meetings so that we can reserve the meeting time to be a time to sort of hone our recommendations and that sort of thing. So in the spirit of that, um, wanted to see if there, I, I came up with five different areas just to start off with that we could focus on you know, um, tracking down information, doing some, you know, research just online, uh, and wanted to see what people had energy around, wanted to see what people had interest around. I'm just gonna go ahead and um, explain what those are real quickly. And we got a lot of information today, but one area is the accreditation and standards. You heard the officers talk about CALEA, which is the Commission on Accreditation for law enforcement agencies and post, which is the peace officer standards and training. Um, we can look into information about that. You know, what are the standards? How are we meeting them? How are we exceeding them? Uh, and that may include the eight can't wait protocols as well. Uh, the second area is training information. I believe um, that we had talked about and um, Bob had mentioned in his recommendations, a trip to the academy. Uh, but we're also looking at things like what textbooks are being used, what is the curricula, who determines uh, the curricula, who are the instructors. I think Bob said he was one of the instructors, so this may be a good place for him to plug in. You know, um, uh, tracking down more information about that fair and impartial policing. You know, who's doing the training? Where do they get their standards from? And then the idea of um, more training for managers. The third one was excessive force, and I have a variety of different um, examples of that. Another area we could focus on was traffic stops. Um, there's Gideon's Army produced the Driving While Black report that had a lot of really um, important information about traffic stops. You know, what is the current policy now that Chief Anderson's retired? He really focused on traffic stops 
is that still happening? Is there still a quota or a number of arrests or stops? And then fifth is disciplinary procedures. You know, what are the specific consequences for each violation? Who decides? You know, one of the complaints we heard from the FOP and from the officers was that Chief Anderson could act unilaterally sometimes and really not follow the um, proper procedures for discipline. You know, who has the power to make those decisions? So that those were just some areas that I came up with. If people have, you know, areas that they really want to focus on, um, yeah, if, if you want to volunteer yourself for something, but we would really like to set it down each time as to what you're going to do between meetings, and then we can come back and report out or great. via email. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lucas. I think that's great. Let me just, let's start with uh, volunteers here. With We've got five uh, assignments or topics here, and so that probably would be what about two to three of us on each one. Um, that, let's, so let's begin. Anyone have a, a preference on where they'd like to put their energy and focus for the week? Yeah. yeah. I would like to look into the curriculum, um, how they come up with the curriculum, who's in charge of choosing the curriculum. Um, I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, um, that's the standards Mr. for that. Mr. Cheryl, yes. Mr. Cheryl, thank you. So that's the training component. Thank you. Got you down. Anyone else? You can go in order here. Mr. Allen, anything that um, um, speaks to you with your background and in, in, in focus? No, Ms. Bilal? If that interests me, and you're welcome to assign me to whichever one is left over at the end. That's fine. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Um, what about Mr. Delgado? Uh, I guess there was mention about maybe going to the police academy um, and mm -hmm. doing some research there, and that's something that I would be interested in. Thank you. I think um, I think about the placement, and I, and I, I think we'll, we'll have to connect with Mr. Budden and, and uh, Ms. Sorello here about the feasibility of that. I think that's a great, uh, something that as many of us that can safely do so should participate in. Um, Mr. Delgado, if you're okay with it too, though, I, I'd love, um, just based on the questions you were asking and the space, are you comfortable also um, looking into the uh, training component of, of the work? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's why the uh, academy aspect. So if, it, if that's going to be something that may or may not happen, or the group will do, I, and uh, a more uh, focused group would be on the training, absolutely. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's perfect. Ms. Freeman? Ashley, I'm so sorry to have to ask this, but I don't, I don't have the ability to have it in front of me. Can you run through the five things one more time? Absolutely. I sure will. So the first thing is, uh, um, well, actually, Ms. Lucas, you want to run through them? Sure, no problem. Uh, the, I'm sorry, I, it was a lot of information at one time. One would be kind of the accreditation and standards, such as CALEA and POST and the Eight Can't Wait. Uh, two would be uh, training information, like the trip to the academy, who are the textbooks, curricula, instructors. Three is uh, excessive force, like the continuum that the lieutenants explained to us. Um, how we compare with other cities. We just got that report in um, taking a look at that. Four is traffic stops. Um, what is the current policy uh, now that Anderson's uh, no longer with us? And then five are disciplinary pr procedures. You know, what are the specific consequences for each violation? Who decides? So on. Thank you so much for that. Ashley, you can plug me in wherever I'm needed. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. I think uh, if you're comfortable with it, we could look at um, excessive force. That'd be great. Um, your background and uh, more around the community, community space, that'd be fantastic. Glad to. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jackson? He had to, he had to drop off. <clears throat> okay. Not a problem. Uh, we can circle back or connect them. Um, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, Mr. Johnson. Yeah, we do. That. Well, I, you know, I don't. Anyone's fine. It doesn't matter to me. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Can we uh, put you down for the accreditation and the standards? 
Sure, that's fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, Ms. Lucas, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip you to go to Mr. Is Mr. Matthews, did he, was he able to join us this evening? I'm sorry if I missed him. I don't believe he was able to join us. Um, let me go to um, Mr. Oliver. Is he with us? Is Mr. Oliver still with us? We may as well. Okay. We may have to do a little bit of a uh, volley poll here, Ms. Uh, Lucas, <laughs> and we'll email folks uh, accordingly. But I want to give people space. Mr. Pulley did say um, that he was uh, more than open um, to to researching it and, and being placed anywhere. So uh, let me keep going, and then we can place them appropriately. Mr. Robinson? Ms. Davis, I, I would like to be a part of the excessive force review, please. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Robinson. And Mr. Woods. Yeah, Mr. Woods. Mr. Woods. Yes, accuracy, of course, especially whether the data is accurate or not. Excessive force. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So we got excessive force all built up here. Per perfect. So we, we'll, I believe everyone that's on the call has got an opportunity to so like Miss uh, Bilal, I know you were saying you were open to all spaces. Would you be uh, comfortable in the traffic stops and driving while black for report? Sure. sure. Okay, fantastic. And we'll send this out succinctly so that everyone can see it um, and, and all very clear. Um, ahead of time, and we'll share a few more details so everyone's aware of what, what we're asking as well. I appreciate everyone's work on that. Ms. Lucas, anything you would share on that before we proceed? Ms. Lucas? Sorry. Thank no you. <laughs> um, that I'm very interested, obviously, by the questions that I asked um, in the issue of who is teaching the perspective taking and implicit bias training and um, all of that. So uh, I'm going to follow up about um, the person that they said runs that training. Fantastic. Obtain that curriculum. That might be a good place for uh, Mr. Allen, just because he and and Ms. Davis. I was going to also ask for permission to in the use of force uh, review to use Mr. Woods for the taser exhibit. If that's all right, do you mind if we taser Mr. Woods? I stay far away from. Him. <laughs> well, honestly, he's okay with it. He's on mute. That's perfect. So, so Ms. Lucas, I think that's fantastic. Great suggestion also on Mr. Allen. I think it'd be um, a wealth of knowledge and, and good perspective on that too. So we can add that as well. Uh, any additional comments, questions here from members of the committee here before we move to the uh, wrap up and uh, uh, forecast? Could I? Sorry, did you say that we were all going to do like a tour of the training academy here? Is that is that in the plans? Yeah, you know, uh, Ms. Bilal, that was that's my my hope is that um, we, we will be able to work that out. And certainly it makes sense that maybe not all 14 of us, it, you know, in, in this condition, but if we can work it out to feasibly ensure at least, you know, maybe it's two groups, three groups, uh, are what's feasible. But I plan in my follow-up call, I follow up call with Mr. Button and uh, Ms. Cirillo tomorrow to ask if they can check on that with, the, with a bit of speed, if we could. That'd be great. Okay, fantastic. Mr. Woods? Could I give Ms. Cirillo's email or ask her just to email me so I'll have it? I've got some fairly serious questions about the data they sent her. <laughs> Delighted to do so, Mr. Woods. Looking forward to your email. I have your email and I'll send you my information, but if you need it over the air, it's dia.cirillo at nashville.gov. Mm-hmm. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rello. Mm -hmm. If you thank you for emailing Mr. Woods too. Any additional comments, questions here from members of the committee? Here. Okay, fantastic. I, I miss uh, Lucas. Anything you want to share on the wrap-up component here before we we end for the evening? 
No, just please continue to um, email us. If you don't want to email the entire committee, you're more than welcome to email me. I'm just going to be continuing to compile people's suggestions and add them yeah. to a list of suggestions. I already took Larry's and Bob's and just kind of did bullet points with them. So anything like that that you have, anything you have some interest around, you know, Mira already did some research in the interim about, you know, non-lethal um, ways of controlling suspects. So please feel free to do that. Please feel free to work outside the meeting, not just on these things that you've agreed, these assignments that you've agreed to, but just anything that you think the committee needs to think about um, would be really helpful. And please feel free to send it to me and I'll just keep compiling stuff uh, for us to review. One thing that I would love to see, if there's any way, Amanda, is if we could have just like a little library for this committee so that everybody has one place that we could go to that has all the documents that we should be reviewing. I know somebody said, oh, we've got a lot to read over Labor Day weekend, and I just want to make sure I read everything. Everything's kind of spread out with attachments and a lot of emails that we all get, and if there was just one location or link that we could go to where all of our documents could be housed for this committee, that would be awesome. Yes, it's a great point, absolutely. Ashley had already raised that issue of coming up with a, you know, Dropbox or I think SharePoint or something. So we are definitely working on that. I'm also working on compiling a glossary because I know that one of the things about law enforcement is like, a lot of industries, we love our acronyms. And so there's a lot of acronyms that will come up like SMEs for subject matter experts and MOU for the memorandum of understanding. So I've been working on compiling a glossary for folks just to try to help. So I will put, once we decide on a good uh, repository for all those documents, we'll definitely include a glossary to see like BWCs, body worn cameras, uh, I think could be helpful because some of the documents do over rely, I think, on acronyms. It's a great suggestion. Thank you, Ms. Lucas. Thank you, Ms. Palazzo, too. And we will look in that way. The SharePoint OneNote, we'll figure out what's most uh, you know, appropriate through our technology services through Metro. I want to thank everyone for your evening tonight, um, and for your time, uh, your expertise, and the fact that we all stay incredibly engaged. Um, I, I truly appreciate it. Recognize this uh, going into a holiday weekend, a very unique one considering the pandemic, but I do hope everyone stays safe. We will follow up quickly, uh, meaning before the end of the business day so that we can offer a snapshot of what we've talked about. I know they'll work on the notes and thank you to Ms. Crawford for that. So we won't have the meeting notes, but at the very least, we'll have what we've agreed upon today. So um, thank you very much. If there are not any uh, additional announcements or comments here, let's all go get some protein in us. Uh, and have a good evening, too. Have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.